Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start on my review of The Machine Crusade by Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson. This is the second book in the Legend of June series. It tells the story of the Butlerian Jihad. And uh, as always, I'm going to read you the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out my tabs before I share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. Obviously, this is the second book in a three-part sort of trilogy, prequel trilogy. So you're going to want to read all of that in order anyway. But there is some really cool stuff in this because it covers the war between um, humans and the thinking machines. So, Dane reads... Legends of June 2. The first battle was a victory, but the war is just beginning. The Machine Crusade. Earth is a radioactive ruin, but the initial campaign of the Butlerian Jihad has given new hope to mankind. Where once all powerful machines ruled, free humanity, inspired by Serena Butler, whose murdered child has become a symbol of the impressed, unites for war against the thinking computers. The authors of Prelude to June have turned to a new and pivotal epoch in the history of the Dune universe to tell the story most eagerly anticipated by its readers. Um, and yeah, also, so obviously, it's, um, Serena Butler is one of the characters in this and my friend Sabrina is Sabrina Beaver so I kept thinking of, about Sabrina Beaver all the time I was reading this. And there are a lot of um, quotes at the start of each of the chapters that I'm going to highlight as well. Um, that's just a common thing throughout all of the June books. Um, so this is from the Mwadru Chronicles. There is no such thing as the future. Humankind faces multiple possible futures, many of which hinge on seemingly inconsequential events. Which is very true. We get this little bit with one of the robot contraptions. Uh, the silver update sphere, still hovering in the air, said in a loud voice, I have never experienced anything quite like that sensation. You felt the machine equivalent of human pain. I think you were about to scream. Don't be absurd. And that just made me think of um, the Harlan Ellison title, I have no mouth but I must scream, or whatever it is. A uh, great quote here, so this is Kogito Quina from The Art of Aggression. Unfortunately, some wars are won by the side that is the most fanatical in a religious sense. The victorious leaders harness the holy energy of collective insanity. Okay, so this was interesting. Uh, one of the robots essentially takes on a, uh, a bet, so we get... You do not fully appreciate the situation, Omnius. Begin with any healthy human. If taken at a formative age, when its mental systems remain pliable, any one of those poor humans can be trained. Given the opportunity, even the most bedraggled child could become brilliant, nearly our equal. Hovering near Erasmus, the watch eye magnified its viewing mechanism for a closer look at the pens. Any of them? That is doubtful. Nevertheless, I have found it to be true. And they basically end up going, setting out to prove this. And it's just very uh, My Fair Lady, isn't it? Very Pygmalion. And um, this was just an interesting little cultural thing from some of the, you know, human warriors. Since so many of their people were killed in battle, the island society had to adapt, encouraging more offspring than usual. Young Jinnah students travelled from island to island and took mates indiscriminately. It was considered a candidate's duty to have three children before journeying off-world to fight in the furious jihad. One child to replace the father, one to replace the mother, and a third as a spiritual duty to those who could not reproduce for whatever reason. And we kept this great little um, exchange, which is kind of how I think about relationships and women. Why don't you find a woman, Vorian? She could tame you and give you something to look forward to each time you came back to Seleucia. Tame me? Vor shot him a wry smile. Would I inflict myself on some poor innocent female? Uh, and then here, this is Holtzman, the scientist, and it says, He ordered his customary fare. Holtzman liked something specific every day, according to a set routine. He preferred to do things in predictable ways so that he could lay out each day without time-wasting distractions. The serving slave, a pretty brunette in a white lace dress, emerged with a tray of steaming hot coffee. She poured him a cup the size of a soup bowl and he sipped carefully. And that just reminds me of what Mark Zuckerberg does. He has a wardrobe of the same clothes so that he just wears the same outfit each day and doesn't have to decide what to wear. And we have this moment where somebody fires a las gun into a personal shield and we know from previous books that that's a very bad idea. It basically causes like an atomic um, detonation. So we've got a Tlaxu religious passage here. Humans are slaves to their mortality from the moment of birth to the moment of death. Again, very true. And uh, then on Arrakis, someone uh, we get, he spat into the reddish dust then seemed to regret wasting the moisture. And that just kind of foreshadows even though obviously this is written afterwards but Fremen culture um, and we're learning basically the origins of the Fremen in this book a quote from Norma Senva uh, mathematical philosophies life is about choices good and bad and their cumulative effects and she's a major character in this actually one of my favorite characters too and Xavier is uh, he's the father of Mannion Butler who um, is the infant that was killed that basically inspired the Butlerian Jihad 
and we get but Xavier stood by looking somber as if disturbed by his thoughts after a long life of unprecedented service and effort was that to be remembered as his greatest achievement to be the father of a murdered child I can imagine that would be tough wouldn't it uh, Zen Sunny Lament what sort of god would promise us a land like this that's referring to Arrakis or Dune. We actually on the same page get one of the kind of early references to the planet as being a Dune. And we get uh, this, which again kind of foreshadows what the Fremen end up doing, especially to enemies. In their most forlorn moments, Ishmael had heard some of the survivors talk grimly about eating flesh and drinking the moisture of the dead, but he railed at the horrific suggestion. We must give up our lives before we give up our humanity. Bud Allah has cast us here for a reason. This is our test or punishment, a sorting of the faithful. What use is it to sacrifice our souls for one meal if we are hungry again tomorrow? And I just thought this was cool as well. Um, so, Ever since he had succeeded in teaching the former wild boy to follow basic civil behaviour, Erasmus had concentrated on boosting Gilbertus' memory capacity through mental exercises. 37,868,040,156, Erasmus said. What Earth's human population would have been today, based upon birth and mortality projections, if Omnius had not intervened and if the planet had not been destroyed. Yeah, the, the, the Earth cannot sustain that kind of amount of life. Uh, and then, basically, Serena Butler realises she's going to have to make a, a big sacrifice to continue the jihad and to sort of re-inspire people. And she leaves behind this speech, which I think is quite beautiful. So I'm just going to read a couple of paragraphs of this here. How ironic it is that our lives, our very thoughts, have been shaped by the thinking machines. Omnius destroyed all of my dreams, everything I wanted for my future. But the Kojito Quina taught me that the tapestry of history is woven of powerful threads, most of which cannot be seen except when you step far enough away and look at a larger perspective. I understand that you have always loved me, but I could never give either of you as much as you deserve. Instead, a higher power had laid out a more important purpose for the three of us. Would we really have been content with quiet lives? God grants such kindnesses only to weak people. For us, he had a greater design. It has fallen upon us, an Iblis Jinjo, to turn the long, dark journey of human survival into the blazing light of the Jihad. Greatness has its own rewards and bears its own terrible cost. And in her last message to Xavier Harkonnen, uh, she says, I do not fear death, for I was fortunate to have been born in the first place. This life is a gift and was never really mine at all. I fear death, but then life is a gift that I don't want to give back. And we get this, which is obviously a precursor to uh, the f f Litany Against Fear, which I have tattooed on my arm. Um, Erasmus. The name filled her with abhorrence and terror. Breathing rapidly, she remembered a mantra that her mother had taught in the city of introspection. I have no fear, for fear is the little death that kills me over and over. Without fear, I die but once. So the full litany is, I must not fear, fear is the mind killer, fear is the little death that brings total oblivion, I will face my fear, I will permit it to pass over and wash through me, and when it has passed I will turn my inner eye to follow its path, where the fear has gone there will be nothing, only I will remain. And then we get this terrible scene where um, basically the, the, the sorceresses are able to use like brain power to like fry uh, the Cymec brains, the brains of the like half robot, half human people. And um, yeah, basically the like major sorceress and another one of the major characters are in a ship and they're caught by a Cymec and they use this psychic energy to obliterate the Cymec and themselves. But it was the one Cymec that had, did, you know, turned traitor on the machines and was actually helping the humans. And it's just like, oh, what a cost for a simple misunderstanding. What a cost. That's fuck the jihad right up. So here we have from Norma Senva's private lab journals, another one of the major characters, she said, Time! We always have too little or too much, never just enough. And uh, Serena Butler in her last message to Xavier Harkonnen, she said, There are countless ways to die. The worst is to fade away without purpose. Iblis Jinjo in The Landscape of Humanity, he said, In war there are more ways to lose than there are to win. Uh, and he loses in a very spectacular way by getting driven into the heart of a sun. Primero... Primero Xavier Harkonnen in a private letter to Vorian Atreides. He says, I do not give a damn about history. I will do what is right. And that says a lot about him. And I think it's interesting to note just how different the Harkonnen family in this is to the Harkonnen family of the, you know, Ultimate Dune series. Bit of Zen Sunny Fire poetry. Night is a hole in yesterday and a tunnel into tomorrow. Beautiful. And uh, here we get one of, the, one of the threads in this which I really enjoyed is the escape of the slaves and the way that they become the Fremen. And it literally ends in a paragraph um, that kind of leads into that. So, with a smile, Ishmael looked around from face to face. 
We can live on this world as we choose, making our own lives and future. We shall never be slaves again. He sighed with immense pride and added, From this day forward, we shall call ourselves the free men of Arrakis. Great stuff. So yeah, as I kind of alluded to there, I like the fact that there are so many different threads going on in here. I did find it occasionally difficult to remember who was on whose side. Um, but you know, that's my fault as a reader more than anything. It was also a very dense print in this edition, but it is what it is. Um, Obviously, it's the second book in a trilogy, so if you've read the first book and enjoyed it, keep reading. It has very much this sort of similar stuff in there, including all of this great stuff on um, the differences between man and machine. So that was really cool. And it um, ends with some high-profile deaths as well, which makes me wonder what's going to come in the next book. So I'm intrigued to read that, so I'll be looking out for that. So yeah, overall, I gave it probably a week four out of five. Um, it started slower than it ended, so there is that. And uh, yeah, would recommend though. So as always, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more. And I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. What happened way past, we were only late The lack of true communication Phone to him right by the other A sad story by its cover If we had been honest Let our feelings show We could have taken a different path But how were we to know? Take it.